you have your open your Bibles this morning to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3. Hebrews 12, verse 3. Living the Christian life, we're going to need endurance. We're going to need to keep on going. And uh, that is something we always need to do. And so today I want to talk about uh, endurance, keeping on. Um, talked with my dad this week. My dad, of course, lives in San Antonio. Uh, and the uh, San Antonio Spurs won the championship of the NBA this year, if you didn't know that. <laughs> one person knows that. Uh, and um, uh, one of the things they said about the Spurs was their persistence. They were persistent. They kept doing the same things. They kept working their plan. They endured. They never gave up. They never gave in. They endured. And that's what the author of Hebrews wants to tell us today, to endure. There are things that are going to go wrong in your life. There are things that are going to be problematic in your own life and heart. And, and there are things that are not going to go the way you planned them to. But I have to say to you today, and God would say to all of us today, that we can persevere. We can endure those things because he that is in us is greater than he that is in this world. So read with me if you would, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 3 through verse 29. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostilities against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. The Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastens every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there for whom the father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which we have all participated, or all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have, an earth, we have earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. For the moment, of, for the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields a peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. See, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it becomes defiled. That no one is sexually immoral or un unholy like Esau, who sought his birthright for a single, sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire in darkness and gloom and a tempest, and a sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words um, made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. Even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have, become, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festival gathering, 
and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, to sprinkled and to the sprinkled blood that speaks of a better world than the blood of Abel. See to it, or see that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will they escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised. Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Heavenly Father, we ask tonight, today that we would understand the reality that we are not to lose heart, that we are to keep on going because of the great and powerful and mighty promises that you have given to us. Lord, help us in our weakness. As it says here, when our knees are weak, when our hands are drooping, when our paths are unsure, give us the confidence of your holy word, of your promises that will strengthen us for the day and trouble ahead. Father, we ask these things today that when people look at our lives, they would see something that is not of this world. They would see the power of God manifested in our own lives. Father, do with us what you will. Make us the people you want us to be. We take our hands off our lives, our church, our jobs, our families, and say, Lord, they are yours. We are here to worship. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're getting to the close of Hebrews. And he's going to give you some practical instruction today. He says, don't give up. Don't lose heart. Don't stop doing and living for the Lord. He says that in verse 3, which summarizes that whole passage. He says, consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Consider him. Consider Jesus. Consider what he has done. Because the tendency in our life is to grow faint-hearted, is to slack off, to become weary, to become tired, isn't it? It happens to all of us. You know, we might think that, oh, I'll never become faint-hearted. I'm on fire for the Lord. Every one of us can become faint-hearted. Every one of us can become tired and weary. We can become disinterested. We can become disinterested in our own walk with the Lord. Some of you may know who Bjorn Borg is, the Wimbledon has been going on for the last couple weeks. Bjorn was a tennis player who won Wimbledon. And he said this, he said, my greatest point is my persistence. I never give up in a match. However down I am, I fight until the last ball. My list of matches show that I have turned great many so-called irreversible defeats into victories. You see, this chapter just says that Christian life is not a picnic, is it? It's bound to be rough. People who tell you that Christian life is a pic picnic haven't read the book of Hebrews. In fact, they haven't read the Bible. Because the Bible says that it's not a picnic. It is rough. And that's why he says and commands us to consider him 
who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. You think you have it tough. It's hard living with your neighbors, isn't it? It's hard living with your boss or maybe your mother-in-law or father-in-law. It, it's, it's hard. But think of what the Lord had to put up in his earthly ministry. Think of the attitudes that were expressed towards him. Think of the rebuke that he had to give even his own disciples because they kept going back and becoming faint-hearted and they didn't place their faith in the one who could take them home. The Bible reminds us that the Christian life will be a life many times of persecution. The servant is not greater than his master. If the world persecuted him, he will persecute us. You see, that's what happens when people you love. When you identify with somebody and put your stock with the somebody, you're identified with them. Husbands and wives know this. When, when the husband is down, the wife gets down or, or vice versa. When, the, when, when there's something that happens to the wife, the, the, the husband feels persecuted as well or, or vice versa. And that's what Jesus did. Fans of teams. And when we put our life in together with somebody else, we inevitably realize that we're not greater than the person we follow. There are three reasons why these heartbreaks and disappointments and difficulties come to us. I'm going to give you three reasons today. One is the discipline of love. The other one is the demonstration of life. And the third is the demarcation of truth. Discipline of love, the demonstration of life, and the demarcation of truth. Discipline of love. Look at what it says in verses 4 through 8. It says, in your struggle against sin... You have not requested, resisted to the point of death or shedding of blood. You have, you have, and have you forgotten the exhortation that is addressed to you as sons? My sons, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the discipline, for the discipline, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastens every son he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating to you as a son. For what son is there whom the father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. These Christians that are Paul is writing to are persecuted and they're being tempted with discouragement. And the writer is saying, don't look on what is necessarily the darker side, but look on the lighter side here. There is something good about God's discipline, isn't there? There's something good. And that's always encouraging. First of all, it, it, it's not very encouraging. We, we, the, the writer here is saying it, it could always be worse, right? Right? Because he, he tells us that we have not resisted to the point of what? To the point of death. He said it could be worse. That life could be a lot worse. But he is disciplining you so that you'll trust and love and exalt him. Romans 8.32 reminds us, it says, He did not spare his own son, but gave, us, gave him up for us all. Will he not also graciously give us all things? When you're going through the discipline of God, when you're going through the disappointments and trials of life, which are brought on by God because of our discipline that is needed to be children of God, realize he is going to give you all things. He's going to give you everything to get by. When Jeremiah began to complain to the Lord about his problems, you know what the Lord said to him? He says here in Jeremiah 12, verse 5, he says, If you have raced with men on foot and they have worried you, how will you compete with horses? And in a safe land, you are so trusting. What will you do in the thicket of Jordan? And God reminds Jeremiah and us when trials come, listen, it could be worse. 
I mean, just because we have to do this or this or this, things could be different and they could be a lot worse. I mean, think about all the advantages we have in this country. The celebration of the 4th of July, the, the freedom that we enjoy. I mean, we could, be, we could be in a place where this kind of gathering would not or could not even exist, could it? Many of our brothers and sisters die daily because they identify with Jesus Christ. And God says this, our hardships prove our sonship. Our hardship proves our sonship. God doesn't discipline those that aren't his. I mean, every boy knows that his father doesn't discipline what? His neighbor's children. He disciplines who? He did he, you, right? My dad disciplined me. And he did it many and various ways. Right? You can imagine those ways. God's not disciplining the children of darkness. He's disciplining his own. And so when we go through struggles and difficulties, we need to see them as part of God's refining fire. Disciplining us. It says in verse 9 through 11, besides this, we have earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. You know, I hear, I hear this all the time. You know, we don't respect them in the middle of it. But I hear this all the time. You know, they weren't that. They, they were pretty smart back then. You know, when you're going through the discipline, what do children do? Rebel? Cry? Oh, please, 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 please. I'll never do it again. Right? But you, it says, it says, for they disciplined us for a short time, it seemed best to them, but he, meaning God, disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. For the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields a peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. You know, parents discipline. Fathers, mothers discipline. Now, are fathers and mothers always right? No, they're not, are they? But you know what? God is. He's never wrong. On, Wednesdays we were on Wednesday night, we were talking about things that God cannot do. God cannot be wrong. Right? God cannot sin. Right? God cannot be more glorious than he is now. Right? God cannot be tempted, nor can he tempt. He cannot be unloving. He cannot be unjealous. He cannot be... You can put anything there you want to about his character... He cannot forget, he knows all, and he cannot be weak. For he's the one that has all power. But he can't be wrong. God can never be wrong. And so God loves us, he, God loves us, and he sends us exactly what we need in this life. And the, I found that this is a great definition of what it means to be a Christian. A Christian is this, listen, one who is completely fearless, continually cheerful and constantly in trouble. Did you hear that? One who's completely fearless, constantly cheerful, and com constantly in trouble. Now, now, God's not expecting you when you go through difficult times to paint a smile on your face and just grin and bear it, is he? You, he he's not asking you to say, hallelujah, it hurts. He's not asking you to do that. He wants you to be real. He wants you to be yourself. But he is saying this. You should say, hallelujah. It helps. 
It helps. He says the discipline of the Lord when we have been trained by it in verse 11, it yields a peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who what? Have been trained by it. It's difficult at times to see God behind things like this. We complain, we, we, we offer things to God, but it's difficult to believe that God sends these things, which he does. You're saying, well, Satan sends them. I'd say, no, God sends them. He uses Satan's perhaps, but you never look far enough if you just look at the immediate instrument. If you just look at the thing that happened, you have to look the one behind it all to see that God sends these things. And they come to us as blessing, as blessing. I read an article and I just want to share this with you. The article said this about the, the times that we have our difficulty. It says The article says, things are becoming a little rough and you want to quit. The pressure is too great. You say, no one appreciates your effort to spread the gospel. The, the government is closing down your missionary bookstore at your hospital. Some religious bigot is incising people to break up your meetings. People in the office are complaining about your Christian witness. They say your, your halo fits too tight. Neighbors are beginning to look at you as a nuisance. Someone wrote a letter in which he implied that your ideas were fanatical. Your family says you're too old-fashioned. You should stop forever going to that church. God's promised in his children there is a discipline and if you receive the discipline of the Lord you can say hallelujah because it's helping you it's helping me it's helping us in Isaiah 54 verses 7 and 8 God never promised his children that dark days wouldn't come he promised that fulfillment would follow in other words, when we go through difficult times, God's promises say that we will be overcomers of that difficulty because he will strengthen us, he will guide us, he will, he will be the one that supplies all the resources that we need for this life. God's plan is good. Even when God sends the disciplining hand, the purifying fire, God is good. And so when we go through difficulties, don't look down, look up. God is working. God is molding our heart. We sing a song, make me and mold me, fill me and use me. Do we really believe that? Don't throw in the towel. Don't throw in the towel. It says here that we shouldn't have weak knees. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 59, when the enemies shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. You know, the battle in our life is not our battle. It's the Lord's. Even at the time when we are being disciplined, he is training and teaching us that the battle we fight, the difficulties we fight in spreading the gospel, in living the life that we are to live, is the Lord's, not ours. God is working. God is living. God is, God is doing amazing things in lives of people. And he does that through discipline. The discipline of love. He also does it in the demonstration of life. Look, it says, therefore, lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight the paths for your feet so that what is lame may not, not be put out of joint, rather it may be healed. Strive for peace with everyone without which... Uh, um, and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Verse 15. See to it that it is not, that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. That no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. And by it may it become defiled. That no one is sexually immoral and holy like Esau who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterwards when he desired to inherit a blessing he was rejected. For he found no chance to repent though he sought it with tears. 
There's a demonstration of living here. Not only a, 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 a discipline of love, but there's a dis demonstration of how we live. And the first thing he says to us is that, listen, there's a correction. Lift up your drooping hands. I say this all the time to the kids we play baseball with. Kids will strike out. And you know what they'll do? They'll cry. I probably would too. They cry. Do you know why? They want to do so good. They want to do so well. They cry. We always say, crying's not for baseball, right? But I always say, you got to lift your head up. Because you know what? They're going to get to bat again. They're going to get to throw it again. It's not the last time they were going to go to bat. The Bible says that here, we, we might be resisting, but we haven't resisted to the point of death. Guess what? We're going to get to bat again. We're going to get up to the plate again. We're going to get another opportunity to glorify God by realizing that there's a demonstration of life that happens when God disciplines our hearts. He says, strengthen your knees. Make your path straight for your feet. He's saying, stop being weak. Strengthen these things. And to learn how to live with peace with your neighbor. He says, strive for peace with all men. And above all, follow after or seek after the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Sanctification just means the proper use. How something is properly used in the kingdom of God. We are sanctified, becoming more and more like Christ because that is what we are made to be for. That's our proper use. To be those windows or those image bearers that reflect the glory of God to the world. Holiness is a sense of dependence upon and the availability to God. That is what makes the world sit up and take notice when they see Christian men and women not with droopy hands, not with weak knees, not with feet that don't know where they go, are going, but they, they see men and women that are raising their hands and, and strengthening their knees and their body so they have concern for others. It says, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. And it says that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble and by it may become defiled. There's two things in living the Christian life here that will prevent you from living the Christian life. Bitterness and flippancy. Bitterness and flippancy. Bitterness is always wrong. Always wrong. No matter how justified our cause to be bitter is, to have a bitter attitude is always wrong. It's always of our flesh. The trouble is, it's a disease. It's contagious. An unforgiving spirit can be contagious all around. And that's the problem of many in our church today and the church around the world. We're, 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 we're bitter. Another thing is flippancy. It says, remember how Esau sold his birthright? He didn't consider that worth anything. He, he took things of the spirit lightly. He, he considered them unimportant. And God says, there are two things in the Christian life here. If you're going to be dealing with the tribulations and trials of life, you cannot become bitter about how things have gone or how people treat you. Forgiveness is such a big thing in the Christian life. If God has forgiven, I mean, we, we've offended God much more than we've offended each other, right? And if God forgives us, let me ask you, are you better than God? And if God says that when we forgive, how many times we forgive? He says, what, 70 times 7? 
He's saying if you hold that bitterness in your heart, guess what? You're going to, when, when, when you hold bitterness against people and unforgiveness against people, when the discipline of God comes, you're going to be grumpy. And we don't want grumpy people, do we? Do you like to be around grumpy people? Husbands, do your wife ever tell you you have the grumps? Wives, do your husband ever tell you you have the grumps? We just have to realize, and we can't forgive if we consider the things of the Spirit unimportant. Esau considered them unimportant. He didn't care about them. He despised his birthright. He said, I don't have time for those things. I don't have time for studying the scripture. I don't have time for walking with God. If you don't have time for God, if you don't have time for walking in the scriptures, and if you don't have time, let me just say this, for evangelism, you have too much going on that's not of God. Esau had a hard heart. And he desired, then he, all of a sudden he desired to have the blessing, but it was rejected because it says there he found no chance to repent though he sought it with tears. Bitterness and flippancy. If you're going to live the Christian life, if you're going to receive the discipline of God, God wants to work in the importance of your relationship with him and the importance of forgiving. I mean, Esau couldn't get back his birthright. His father could not change his mind. And if we're going to have concern for other people, we're going to live a life of concern for other people and accept the discipline of God, look what it says it says, for you have not come to what may be touched, in verse 18, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and tempest and a sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made hearers beg that no further message be spoken. In other words, in the Old Testament, when God commanded something and gave his law, eventually people said, no more, no more. It's too hard. And then verse 22, it says, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem and to the assembly of the firstborn. See, if we're going to have a demonstration of life, the Christian life, we don't need to go to the law as though it's going to save us. We need to go to Mount Zion, okay? Not, not, not to Mount Sinai, but to Mount Zion. If we're already convicted of our sins today, if you're already under the pressure of sin and weighed down by sin, don't go back to Mount Zion, I mean, Mount Sinai. Go to Mount Zion where you can find grace for whatever you need. Just real quick, it's, it talks about Abel's blood and Abel's blood... Abel was killed because of vengeance. Jesus was killed because of vindication. God vindicated his justice by killing Jesus. Brothers and sisters, you can be free. You can experience the forgiveness that God has given in our heart. And finally, there is a demarcation of truth in the final section here, verses 25 through 29. I'm not going to read that because of our time. But listen to this. This is a warning passage. A warning passage that God is shaking things. God is shaking things up. In his letter to Timothy, he said, Perilous times will come when men will be lovers of self and hateful. And then he goes through a long list. God is shaking things up. He's shaking things up in our life. He's shaking things up in this world. He's constantly shaking things up. And he's trying to shake up the places that we find security in. Whether they be in numbers, large numbers. We can think if we have a big enough place, we can have security. Or the power of an organization. You know, sometimes we think that 
if, if we get, get with the powerful people, we'll be good. Some people, some people trust in the goodness of man. But we see violence increasing and we, we understand from the Bible that men are not good. And some people trust in the omnipotence of money. I feel like sometimes we, we, we pray, not our Father who's in heaven, but our Father who art in Washington. We think there is wisdom in science. We think all these things. But I want you to look at the last verse. Our God is a consuming fire. What does fire do? It destroys, doesn't it? Or it purifies, right? One of two things. It destroys or it purifies. I want you to get this. Fire will destroy what it cannot purify, but it purifies what it cannot destroy. Fire will destroy what it cannot purify, but it will purify what it cannot destroy. Hold on. Our God is a consuming fire. And what God is doing, he's destroying in our life all the thoughts and patterns of living that are, that are offensive to him. And he's purifying in our hearts all that is good and right. And you might be thinking, I don't want to go through this. I don't like this. You don't have to say hallelujah. It hurts. But you have to say hallelujah. It helps. God is helping you today. God is doing it today. He's purifying our lives. And so what I don't want to do is when God is disciplining us to say no to God. If you're going to say no to God when he's disciplining you, you will probably say no to God. Well, you will say no to God when things are okay. We grow. When do we grow more? When, when we have easy street or when we have to rely on someone other than ourselves? Let me tell you today, I implore you. I don't, I'm not going to beg you. Well, maybe I should. I implore you. Every day of your life, when you wake up in the morning, it is a great day no matter what comes. You know why? Because God is there. You have a chance to know the living, powerful, omnipotent, omniscient, uh, uh, everlasting, uh, just God of this universe. And that's what you were created for. And that, was bring, that brings you happiness. That should get the excitement stirring in your bones. And so whatever may come, whatever discipline may come, you can say it's helping, it's helping. Because God's fire will rid all the junk and purify what is gold. Heavenly Father, I pray today.